Well, hello and welcome to our second session of the Trade Ahead Western Canada Speaker Series. My name is Sharon Sun and I am the Trade Policy Economist at Canada West Foundation here in Calgary. Now, if you've attended our first session, you'll know that we hope to provide here a new type of trade talk to inform Western Canadian businesses and policymakers about changes in the global trade landscape in the year ahead in order to stay informed, be prepared and avoid any trade surprises we've experienced in recent years, COVID aside. And so we invite global experts from the key regions with which we trade to outline some major changes they expect to see this year, followed by questions from people whom you know from the trade apparatus in Western Canada on what these changes could mean for the Prairie Provinces. I want to thank EDC Export Development Canada here, who is supporting our series. So pull up a chair with your lunch, brunch, or merienda, depending on where you are in Canada. For our session today, we are focusing on Canada's third largest export destination and fourth largest two-way trade partner as of uh, 2020, the United Kingdom. From a new trade deal with Canada to joining the CPTPP uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, where is the UK headed post-Brexit and what does this mean for Canadian businesses? Joining us from Ottawa, I'd like you to welcome Andy Barr, who is the Head of Economics and Trade at the British High Commission in Canada. More specifically, he oversees the UK government's trade and economic policy agenda in Canada, supporting both Canadian and Brit British businesses by exploring ways to open markets for the two-way trade and investment, and by working together with Canada in the international platform and international economic forums. He has been in Canada for almost two years now, and this will be his second trip out west, the first being last year before COVID when we were able to travel, where he did, if I can say so myself, one of our best received pop-up policy with me on Brexit and UK-Canada bilateral relations. So welcome, Andy. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. And I turn the table to you now. Thank you. Well, um, Firstly, thanks for having me back and hello everyone who's joining me on this great Thursday afternoon. Um, and thanks for Canada West Foundation for hosting me for a second time. I really enjoyed meeting many of you last time and one of the benefits, I guess, of this virtual world we're living in is that I get to meet many more of you than otherwise would have been possible. Um, now, Carlo very kindly billed me as a straightforward and engaging speaker, so I'll do my best to keep today's session as honest and as candid as possible. Uh, but of course, I rely on each of you and the rest of the panel for this to be engaging. Uh, so happy for you to raise questions throughout, as well as happy for you to get in touch over LinkedIn, Twitter, email, whatever that might be, uh, for follow-up questions and for opportunities for us to work together. I'll talk for a short while, as asked at the start, probably around 10 minutes or so. And then uh, myself and my fellow panelists will do our best, as I say, to keep it engaging. And I wanted to start by saying a few things about Brexit, uh, but then as the talk implies, get beyond Brexit, start to look at the UK's trade and economic agenda for the years ahead and offer a few thoughts about what this means for Canada and obviously Western Canada. Um, so any of you following British news over the last four or five years may have been following the, following the uh, small policy decision of Brexit. Um, we're now in a position where we have secured an EU deal that delivers the Conservative Party's election manifesto, so, so their platform in Canadian lingo. Um, and they promise within that to take control of our borders, our laws, our money, and also to take back control and end a role for the European Court of Justice. So this deal does that. It also achieves zero tariffs and zero quotas. It provides certainty for firms who are operating both in the UK and in the EU. Uh, and it includes legally binding commitments to market access and fair treatment. So we will continue to work with the European Union on all matters of interest to both parties, but I think my key point on Brexit that I wanted to land today is that none of the last few years changes those, those fundamental strengths of the UK economy. 
Um, and so whilst COVID has been an immense challenge for all of us, for everyone everywhere, um, we've now vaccinated over 20 million people in the UK and we're back on track for, for the economy to recover from the COVID shock six months more quickly than originally forecast. So now looking at next summer to return to those levels. Uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention that we're still the, the largest single market for uh, investment, for foreign direct investment in Europe. And we're Canada's second largest investment globally, uh, which is great. Uh, the UK, for what it's worth, is the third largest investor in Canada with the third largest buyer of Canadian goods around the world. And we are the second largest buyer of Canadian services. So again, an established relationship on which to grow. Um, British people buy cereals, they buy vegetables, they buy meat from the prairies, but we also buy machinery for our nuclear sector, uh, electronics, medical equipment and pharmaceuticals. But in the prairies, the UK is at best, uh, I think for one of the three provinces, the ninth largest export destination. And it's the fifth, sixth or seventh largest uh, origin, originating market for, for imports. So what this shows me is there's a real uh, possibility and room for this UK, Western Canada relationship to grow. Uh, so again, it's great to have the chance to talk through that. Now, again, I promise to be candid, we are a long way behind the US here, the US's influence here, but, but this stuff does matter. Um, trade and investment supports jobs, supports growth, supports livelihoods. And so my key message is that Canadians should be looking to do business with their friends across the Atlantic. Now, Brexit aside, the UK trade strategy and, and what is often referred to as global Britain, I wanted to unpack that slightly to give a context of what this might mean for the future. Uh, so much has been focused on Brexit. We're now in a post-Brexit world. I wanted to focus on the future. The current UK government is, I would say, evangelical about free trade uh, and the value of free trade and the investment it brings in creating those jobs and growth livelihoods that I mentioned, of course, providing choice for consumers as well. The Conservative Manifesto commits the UK to covering 80% of our global trade by free trade agreements by 2022. So that's, that's the vast, vast majority. Um, We've had a fantastic start. We've struck deals with 65 countries the last time I checked, and that covers around 900 billion pounds worth of our trade with the world. Um, we're rooting this approach in our, glo our global free trade approach in terms of our values. So there's a strong values dimension to this as well. So, and that those are sovereignty, democracy, the rule of law, and a commitment to high standards. So as well as the benefits that free trade creates for consumers and for businesses, we're also looking to work much more closely with long-standing allies and nations who share our values. And uh, as my Secretary of State puts it, we are trying to put friends and family first. So from my perspective, this is great news for the UK-Canada relationship. And in terms of Canada, those 65 deals that I mentioned were a tremendous amount of work and effort. Um, informal talks with Canada started soon after the EU referendum in 2016. And in December, we signed a trade continuity agreement that will provide a near seamless transition for the UK and Canadian exporters once it's enforced. Now I say once it's enforced because the Trade Continuity Agreement, the TCA, is making its way through Canadian parliamentary processes at the moment. It should be in force uh, very, very soon. It's hard to, to prejudice a vibrant democratic process, but we're hoping in and around the 31st of March, the end of March. Um, and until then, I just want to be clear with everyone that the goods aspects of that Trade Continuity Agreement are protected under an MOU. So. This means that the tariff preferences we enjoyed in 2020 can still be enjoyed today. The TRQs we enjoyed in December 31st still apply today. So there's no major change for businesses uh, there, which again, stability, predictability, good news.
Sorry, Andy, um, just to bear, just to clarify, this is the Canada UK trade continuity agreement that you're talking about um, after Brexit. Yes. So, okay. so Canada and the UK had spent, uh, we weren't able to enter into negotiations at the very beginning of the, uh, of the process after the EU referendum in the UK. But in recent, uh, in the recent years, we've been able to more formalize that relationship. Where we ended up is with a trade continuity agreement. I'll say a little bit more about. Um, this is a temporary arrangement that protects almost the baseline, the, the, the baseline of preferences with which we were operating last year. Um, but, and, and I think this is the exciting bit, we've agreed to negotiate a new bilateral free trade agreement to replace that trade continuity agreement between the UK and Canada that's more tailored for British and Canadian economies and British and Canadian interests. And we've committed to do that in the next 12 months to start that process as soon as possible in the next 12 months, max. Um, and here we have the potential to go much further in areas, all sorts of areas. I know that our secretaries of state and ministers have spoken about digital trade, women's economic empowerment, uh, the environment and new standards, uh, new standards, et cetera. But, the key thing here is like any trade agreement, um, we can look at any areas where stakeholders identify as opportunity. So that's one of the things I hope to get out of today's conversation, because the next step in the UK Canada relationship will be on both sides of the Atlantic will be a, a proper consultation. So we will talk to businesses and other stakeholders to feed in their views about how we can manage to make that UK Canada trade relationship even stronger um, for, for the next decade. So, as I mentioned, our ambition is to start quickly. And my commitment is to engage widely so that we can gather as many views and as much inspiration as possible. Now, aside from, um, you know, the existing MOU that you've just mentioned under this uh, TCA, under the UK China T uh, Canada TCA, sorry. Um, are there anything new in this agreement that, that we should be aware of? No, so the, the trade continuity agreement maintains the, the existing trade preferences. So nothing new in terms of uh, additional market access or anything like that. The whole purpose here was to provide that seamless transition for businesses. And this is one part of our, um, of our strategy as well, our global strategy. Um, we have negotiations ongoing with Australia, New Zealand and the United States. But crucially, in parallel to all of that, we've started our accession process to the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, if I've got that right. Um, and, and this is in fact something that you, Sharon, uh, and Canada West Foundation advocated when I was last in Alberta this time last year and uh, it, it, you may recall I had to keep relatively quiet at the time, uh, keep my cards close to my chest but from my perspective we've moved now to formalize that relationship uh, and formalize the accession process and are looking to really make headroads into joining that group and it's great to have uh, friends at Canada West making the case for the UK's accession so that I don't have to. Um, and, and on that topic, I saw a great op-ed this week uh, to plug from Sharon Carlo and others about the strategic benefits of the UK joining the CPTPP. Um, but really, this is part of our, our plan to position the UK at the centre of a network of global, uh, modern, ambitious free trade deals that support that economic, tr uh, economic growth and jobs. If I might continue momentarily, I wanted to say a couple, a couple more things about the, the overarch, the, the global uh, trade, uh, trade fora, I think you called it at the start. And for here, we are the presidency of the G7 this year. So the UK has a huge opportunity with this presidency uh, to, to take on the mantle of free and fair trade. We've established a trade track within the G7, which is the, the first I'm aware of at least. And the idea here is to support a pandemic response and recovery and look at that modernization of the World Trade Organization and further liberalization within that group. So 
from my point of view, it's more than more important than ever that as we recover from COVID, we address that modernization of the, the global trade rules. And I hope we can make good progress ahead of the ministerial conference, uh, the 12th ministerial conference in December. Um, and look, it, if I was going to summarize all of this um, in terms of what this means for Canada and folks across Western Canada in particular, the prairies, etc. Well, it means an outward facing UK. It means we're rolling up our sleeves and contributing to global trade and economic issues around the world. It means that the continuity agreement I mentioned between our two countries will provide a stable and predictable baseline. Uh, and from there, we can grow our relationship. We can give businesses the chance to input into a negotiating mandate that will set the future terms of trade between two partners. And again, there are opportunities there both in the new bilateral free trade agreement as well as the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it also means that Canadians can rely on a strong uh, values-based and democratic partner that's championing free, free and fair trade around the world. So um, as members, of, uh, as you mentioned in your opinion piece, you've got a new ally in the Pacific, but also in the wider world. So I think that's just about enough from me. I think the golden rule of speaking is to stop speaking before people stop listening. So uh, I will draw it to a close there and, and look forward to the conversation. No, thank you so much, Andy. That was really useful. And I really want to emphasize uh, what two points that you've indicated in terms of addressing modernization of trade rules. Um, you know, UK, if UK joins the CPTPP, it will be the world's sixth largest economy to um, to join this agreement. So I think from that perspective, it may be very beneficial for, for Canada, particularly for the progressive uh, component and, and also in terms of similar structure and rules of trade. Um, so without further ado, let me bring in our partners from the Prairies. Joining us today from, uh, I guess, east to west, joining us today from Winnipeg is Mariette Muller, the president and CEO of World Trade Center Winnipeg. From Alberta, uh, joining us is Mustafa Sahin, the vice president of the Investment and Trade Center in Edmonton Global. And finally, joining us from across the street, um, Patrick, uh, sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong, Patrick Mattern, uh, Vice President of Business Development at the Calgary Economic Development. So I now open our conversation our, our, and expand our lunch table. Who would like to be the first one to ask questions? Well, I'd like to jump in there. Um, first of all, Andy, thank you very much. Um, You've got a great way of presenting, and I, I felt like like uh, bugging you about one of the trades you've done with Harry and Megan, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. But thank you, that, that's, that's a good trade. Um, you've talked about friends and families first, so I heard you say how Canada is absolutely one of the friends, family really, um, but that Western Canada, we still certainly have a lot of opportunity to grab between, as it relates to trade between Western Canada and, uh, and the UK and us in Manitoba, um, one of our strong sectors, most people say agriculture, but more and more we're really looking deeper at, at proteins and, and proteins in, in all its form, uh, whether it's animal protein or, or plant protein, it has become quite a, a number one sector that we are wanting to expand even more, looking at the different markets, who wants it, who can we partner with? What, what, what do you see there as far as protein as it relates to working with UK and potential for trade or collaboration. Thanks, Mariette. Um, and look, I think this is an exciting opportunity. I'm, no, I'm by no means an expert, but I guess a lot is going on there. I've read about the super cluster and the investment and jobs that it's bringing. So I'll do my best. I think two, two three things come immediately to mind. The first is that this fits, especially the plant-based proteins aspect of this, this really fits with the desire to make global food supply chains more sustainable, 
um, protect the environment and also to prevent hunger globally. So, so I see a real opportunity globally as well as in the UK. Um, when it comes, the, the other thought that came to mind immediately was that McDonald's have recently, you know, the beef burger joint have recently uh, announced a McPlant burger. So uh, I know they're not a British company, but I would definitely be uh, be seeing opportunities there. I think this is a sign of the times, uh, quite aside from the the specifics of McDonald's. This is a sign of the times. I read uh, an ING report, a, a Dutch company. I read a report on the European market for plant-based proteins recently, and that saw the UK market doubling by 2025. So that, that's really not, you know, four years to double from a baseline of around about one billion pounds. Um, and it stated that the UK economy was the most developed in Europe. But crucially, uh, giving away the secrets here, but crucially, it said that the UK doesn't have a major player in this area like the US. So I would imagine there's I would imagine that there's a, a market opportunity for Canadian companies there. Yes, we, we were able to attract a big French company called Raquette, who are in different places around the world. But there's all kinds of different opportunities that this is a key, key uh, plant producer or um, uh, so. It's, we've, we grow lentils, we grow uh, all kinds of different, hemp is absolutely a, another one. So there's so much potential around the market, the, whether it's beans, lentils, uh, hemp, and also peas, and also animal protein. So we, we find that you're right, Andy, when we think about this whole uh, consumer trend around plant-based. So, uh, so we're really excited to see what's next for Manitoba and just keep us in mind, okay? <laughs> Uh, Andy, I, I, I got a question again, agricultural related. So um, for years, the UK was part of the common agricultural policy. It was about 35% of the uh, European budget, a big chunk of money. And it had its pros and it's had its cons over the years. And now you're out from underneath the common agricultural policy. So I'm just wondering what the UK has done to pursue their own agricultural policy. What would be the impact as Canadian producers and exporters in regards to any new policy you have in place for agriculture. Sorry, I should take myself off mute as a matter of, yeah, so I think the biggest thing that we've done in terms of trade and agriculture is that around about eight, nine months ago, my Secretary of State uh, launched a trade and agricultural commission and their purpose was to look into the future of UK, uh, UK agri-food trade with the world. Um, and as coincidence would have it, I would plug the fact that they released uh, their first report on Tuesday of this week. Now, I'm not going to go through, I think there are about 22 recommendations, but please don't quiz me on those. Um, but they're focused on things like liberalising agri-food trade, capitalising on the UK's leadership in climate and animal welfare and SPS standards. Um, there's, there are recommendations on collaboration with developing countries. And, uh, and in providing more funding for export promotion. So um, there's a, the, all this is to say that there is a real focus um, and indeed an established organization with a mandate to look at the UK's engagement with global agri-food uh, supply chains. Great, thank you very much. And, and look, one of the things that comes up regularly in the two and a bit years that I've been in Canada is the fact that the the the, the CETA agreement um, the benefits were not felt to be shared by everyone um, one of the reasons cited at least by Canadian businesses for this is that some of the regulatory barriers were um, made, made the markets insurmountable in certain cases now I know that the UK is committed to looking at this science-based approach to regulating standards in this space now there's absolutely no question that we will be lowering high standards in this space, but there is definite commitment that we will look at the science and look at science-led approaches to this. So for instance, at the moment, there's a there's a, a consultation live on gene editing where there's a there's an explicit commitment to look at that moderate science-based approach to, to, to issues like that. So, so GMOs may be back on the table? Well, at the very least, you'll have your have the opportunity to feed into that policy as it develop as it develops. Yeah, terrific. Thank you very much.
Um, I just, I know Andy is the star here, but if I may add, um, last year when Andy was able to physically visit us out west, um, I talked about one of the reports that, um, that myself and two other uh, well-known economists wrote together um, that we've identified Canada as actually one of the most under-traded partners with the UK. And now that UK is out of, um, out of the EU, as you mentioned, Andy, there is a lot of room for cooperation in, on agriculture uh, between Canada and UK, particularly um, when we look at CPTPP, UK definitely does not compete with Canada um, on the agricultural front. And in fact, they complement each other. And my hunch is that we should be seeing um, an increase in certain agricultural uh, product export to the UK, whether that's peas or, or protein products. So, so I think there's opportunities there. But anyways, Andy's still the star here. I'll just mute myself now. Not at all, Sharon, and it's rare that I'm described as a star, so I'll, I'll bask in that glory momentarily. I mean, one of the things with CPTPP is, is that, as you would expect, we've done some thinking around areas in which CPTPP goes further than the existing trade continuity agreement, uh, and looking at ways in which we could take the relationship to the next level, either through CPTPP or through a new FTA. One of the most exciting things about CPTPP, as I'm sure you're aware, being members, um, is, is the prospect of the truly global supply chain so that each of the members can accumulate goods, can, can export, re-import and so on. And I think from my perspective, that's one of the advantages for the UK Canada partnership, whereby we can our, our firms can work together to look at those third markets, uh, and that's something I know that that Sharon and others were were mentioning even a year or so ago. Um, but I think the real opportunity to go further on a bilateral basis will will come through that bilateral FTA in due course. Now, I'm not entirely sure the exact dates for consultation, but I am genuine in my um, in, in my commitment to moving as quickly as possible. So the, the thing to flag there is that both sides will consult, both sides will try and get a view of where they can help their industries to go further, where they can take in the views of wider stakeholders and bring some, bring some kind of values-based issues into FTAs as well. So um, I really am looking forward to that period in which we can roll up our sleeves and talk to businesses about what they need us to do in order to enable them to flourish. Andy, I'm going to shift gears on you a little bit. First of all, congratulations on hosting the G7 this year. Good news is you won't have to worry about the head of the U.S. delegation leaving early to prioritize a meeting with the leader of North Korea over attending the full summit. So good news, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but I am going to shift a little bit to what you just touched on a little bit, which was, you know, the CETA trade agreement and the current state of, you know, the U.K.'s relationship, because Yes, we have a long history of agricultural exports to the UK, but there's a lot of other products, forestry, mining, and so forth. But there's also significant investment by Canadian companies who've invested into the UK as their hub for re-export to Europe, uh, which was you know, covered under the CETA trade agreement. And a lot of the value ultimately in these relationships is in that last mile. And in some of those last mile situations, the third party jurisdiction, the value added you know, processing before you can re-export, hasn't really been addressed yet, either under the trade continuity agreement or the UK's new agreements with Brexit. Given that you know we're interested in balanced trade, which means that yes, we want to export to you, but we also want to export opportunities for Canadian companies to invest in the UK. What does that process look like? How do we address those shortcomings, not dissimilar to what the UK is dealing with in the, the Ireland, Northern Ireland, soft border types of issues, right? That there are a few pieces that still need to be addressed. Yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, we're not gonna face uh, those sorts of issues you mentioned in the G7, but we do have a global pandemic to uh, to contend with. So we're still very, very hopeful that members, that, that leaders of those G7 nations will be able to get to the UK in June. Um, but, uh, but, you know, all of the COVID responses uh, notwithstanding. Um, if I understand your question correctly, it's around it's around what more we could do to help companies reach consumers at that last mile. It's around what we could do 
Actually, more than that, Andy, it's a, you know, when Canadian companies looked at accessing Europe, much in the same way that we looked at Canada as a hub to get to the rest of NAFTA, let's say, um, the UK was the most comfortable, friendly place for us, in many cases, to access Europe for transshipments and or some last minute value added processing to then re-export to Europe. Yeah. Given the current relationship, the current trade agreement between Europe and the EU, some of those are gaps that are now opened up. So how can we work together to identify those shortcomings so that those investments are not lost or what additional things might be needed to make sure the UK can still be a hub for re-export as well to the rest of the EU? Yeah, so I, I think it would, you know, in the interest of, of living up to my straightforward uh, introduction there or builders being straightforward, you know, I can acknowledge that there have been difficulties. There have always, we've always said that there would be additional processes when the UK leaves the EU and that fully frictionless trade with the EU would require that commitment to, to our ongoing alignment with all of the EU rules, which was not compatible with that vision um, of regaining our autonomy, control over our borders, laws, money, etc. Um, that said, we have actually agreed zero tariffs, zero quota access, which is is the most ambitious on goods that the EU has given to any partner. Um, we've established a series of cross-cutting measures um, and and really an overarching framework for cooperation. So th this is not the end of the discussion when it comes to. Uh, comes to trade in the same way that as two independent nations we will continue to talk with Canada once we have an initial baseline in place I guess you could draw uh, draw a comparison there. Um, disruption has been minimal so far um, overall businesses that are based in the UK are adjusting well to the new rules so they'll continue to trade effectively they'll continue to learn and for me, in terms of what we could do, if Canadian companies that, that use the UK as, as a re-export hub face any difficulties, if they're based in the UK, then they will get the full support of the, of the UK government. They'll be treated as any other British exporter. So whether they're Canadian subsidiary or not, they will get the support of the Department of International Trade and other partners in the UK. So they can, you know, please get in touch with myself if it's the Canadian uh, headquarters that want to talk or the subsidiaries in London. And equally, if there are, I mean, I, I'm not aware of, of, of many, or if any, uh, examples of Canadian businesses losing out or finding any friction but if there are talk to us um, and also talk to your fantastic trade commissioner service as well um, they're not paying me to plug them but but they're a great service. And, and Andy just just in that light it's interesting because the Mustafa is always stealing my questions but uh, <laughs> we, we, we run uh, I think each of the cities runs a, uh, a trade accelerator program and we went out to the trade accelerated program graduates and asked what are their priority markets. And the UK always falls at the top three. But one of the concerns that comes back, and you've addressed it, is that that uh, supply chain issue and, and moving stuff onward, uh, both from a COVID and from a Brexit perspective. So you, you've answered it, but it, it is interesting to know that that is something that's top of mind for companies in, in our region for sure. So thank you for the yeah. answer. Yeah, and, and I understand that, that companies use the UK as that export distribution hub, but they also invest in the UK for the, for the kind of fundamentals of their market. You know, the, the sixth largest economy, as Sharon mentioned there, um, by certain measures. So, so not all Canadian companies are using the UK uh, as an onward exporting. For instance, a lot of pension funds are tied up in UK infrastructure. You know, you're not trading that almost. I know that Passengers, for instance, have been down because of COVID, but that, that will recover. So, um, you know, I, it almost goes without saying that I'm a true believer in the economic fundamentals in the UK, in the research, in the innovation, in the education, in the favourable tax, in the English language, common law. There's so much in common with Canada that, that I think it will continue to be uh, the first place that Canadians look in Europe for, for the reasons you mentioned. Patrick just mentioned that trade accelerator program. So we, uh, in course, at the World Trade Center, we've we've delivered that program. And you're right, Patrick, that a lot of our companies, when it's not uh, in the United States, because it still is 80 percent, are still identifying the United States. Um, they're they're they are looking at UK, but a lot of those 
people in the programs are not the big businesses. They're more the small or small, medium-sized businesses that are actually participating in this program. This program is all about giving all the tools so that they can develop a export plan, what we call a bulletproof export plan, so that when they go out there, they have checked with whether it's legal, whether it's a supply chain, whether it's a, um, finances, uh, regulation. So we, we provide as many tools as possible. But, but again, they're SMEs. So are there areas where you see that Canadian SMEs can really benefit from the UK or a, a way for them to be um, in, in that market quite easily? And, and you're right about the trade commissioners. We are very lucky that we have a, a very supportive uh, supportive team there. So, but do you have some, some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it's kind of depend business to business uh, kind of goes without saying. And and as I said in in my intro there, I, I understand that with the la the world's largest economy on your southern doorstep, that that's logical to be the first place that many businesses look, especially SMEs who are starting their export journey. But if you then look to other areas of the world, to Europe and to Asia. Uh, what you have in the UK is many of the same benefits of the United States, the language um, and, and so on. The, the, the free and open economy is really, really easy to do business uh, in terms of their World Bank rankings for ease of doing business. Um, but also in the UK, you've, you've got a much similar legal system to that of Canada. You've got that common law approach. You've got that cultural affinity and that historic links, as well as some real complementarity. So um, I'm always cautious of just throwing out sectors, but one of the areas that, that, that I see in Canada really taking off is, the, is AI and data analytics. And that's an area, of course, that the UK has a global comparative advantage and a real strength. So if SMEs are working in that technological sector, you can see that they might default to looking at Silicon Valley, but they should be looking at the uh, the innovation triangle around uh, Cambridge, Oxford and London, for instance. And there are trade commissioner services as well as on our side, those inward investment uh, advisors who can provide SMEs and other businesses with that support. So it's really difficult to say, uh, it's really difficult to give a broad answer to that because it will depend on the specific business. But there are so many services and so many opportunities that are designed to link those those sorts of relationships together. And I'm happy Andy, to talk about the services, um, not just products. And that's really important when you talk about trade. Many people forget that what 40% of trade is actually um, services, right? So thanks, thanks for that. Sorry, Patrick, your turn. I think Mustafa wanted to jump in on AI or oh. something. Yeah, well, it was that was actually the question I was going to ask because it is a sector that does fit in more with the SMEs, and it's an area where there is some precedence, right? So DeepMind is here in Alberta, uh, Improbable is here, um, and and I know that you know we've got an AI supercluster between Montreal, Toronto, and Edmonton, but uh, you know Calgary is also very active in the tech space. It's something which is, we're seeing right across our province. How can we build on those successes, Andy? And how do we develop literally a strategy specifically focused on greater collaboration in the emerging opportunities, predominantly around AI and machine learning, which we identify really as opposed to a vertical, we almost identify it as a horizontal, which goes across a whole range of sectors. So we're looking at AI in healthcare and life sciences, AI in energy, AI in uh, food manufacturing, right? So across all these areas, and I think that's an area of tremendous shared opportunity that can really speak to, as Marietta said, that SME size company as well. What, what would be a good way, a strategy to develop in a more focused manner that potential? Yeah, so I, I, th I think there's two aspects to this that, that immediately come to mind. The first is a strategy for promotion, for promoting and, and supporting those businesses to make those relationships. And for SMEs, the relationships are going to be everything. So there's obviously access to the right information about the market but realistically if you put two uh, innovative businesses together you know eight times out of ten they'll find a way of doing something even better with the sum of the parts so the promotion bit i think each of the it, it, you've got regional economic development councils and so on and that i think is, is a good ecosystem in the uk perhaps there may be more we could do to join our two trade and investment promotion agencies together but i know we work really closely together as well 
And then the second angle is the policy angle. And I think that's where the consultation on the future FTA comes in, but also a, a genuine, I genuinely mean it when I say my commitment is to engage widely and to listen and learn because the FTA is just one tool. Uh, the free trade agreement, I, I think, will, will include a very strong chapter on SME promotion. Um, I would imagine that if anyone can go further in the area of digital and those kinds of services that the UK and Canada with the shared values they have could go further. Um, but that's only one tool. We can also work together to harmonize standards, to look at market access issues if, if businesses ever face them. You know, a lot of political attention goes into these grandiose agreements around the world, but actually sometimes it's the, the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty economic diplomacy, the, the, the standards evaluations that really make the difference for SMEs. So Sharon, I'm envisioning a position paper by the Canada West Foundation that would recommend a, a joint fund, partly funded by Western Canadian diversification and the UK government specifically to fund, you know, this cross-pollination of tech companies because the geographic disparity also allows for market access because that's where a lot of our Canadian companies struggle with is the go-to-market piece, but Absolutely. also the geographic coverage because, and you know, the UK can cover Asia from the West and we can cover them from the East. You could have really global coverage with the eight hour time difference. Well, I'm really glad you mentioned that. I am definitely going to bring that up to Carlo and it'll be a great continuation of the recent op-ed that we actually, that came out yesterday that Carlo, myself and Dan Chiriak wrote on the opportunities between UK and Canada in the CPTPP. So, well, if you would, if you would pitch it, we would do it. <laughs> I think I just gave you a new job there. <laughs> In that same light, it, it's interesting. You, you've touched on a very key component of Canada and European UK um, interaction, and it's in the research front. And, and Canadian companies have always had access to the, the frameworks, the research frameworks for the European Research Council. And the UK has always been a massive recipient because of the collegial system we have in the UK to receive all kinds of European funding. So it, it's turning into a bit of a quandary now. So Canadian companies and institutions predominantly use the UK as a partner into the European Horizon program and the like. And, and I know that the, uh, the EU and the UK have signed an agreement at the last minute on, on research, but I'm trying to get a perspective as to how Canada and UK work together within that European Horizon framework. Canada has set aside $50 million over the next five years for that European joint research. And is also talking about putting in almost a billion dollars on super cluster coordination with the European Union. Where, where, where is that leaving the UK within this equation and, and how do we continue to work purely on that research front? So, so we have, uh, in, if I'm not mistaken, in every single one of our consulates and uh, missions across Canada, we have science and innovation officers whose purpose is to promote those research and innovation links between the UK and Canada. So almost a, a trade commissioner service, but specifically focused on science and innovation. Um, while you were talking there, a lot of people have asked me about UK funding on innovation. Um, while you were talking there, I drew up the, the homepage of UK research and innovation. You can currently, uh, there are 116 opportunities for, for businesses straight up to bid for funding for, for all sorts of innov innovative activities, research and so on. Um, and in the budget yesterday, uh, were we on? Yes, yes. Yesterday, the Chancellor announced that they're going to review the research and development tax reliefs to make sure that we remain that, that globally competitive, uh, uh, globally competitive destination or hotbed for cutting edge research. So that was one of the many, uh, many, many announcements in yesterday's budget. But in terms of research and development, there's, there's a real commitment to maintain ourselves as a global leader. Yeah, I think it, certainly in Alberta, I think Mustafa touched on it. We've had conversation, the government of Alberta's had conversations. We've had conversations locally with the British Trade Office on things like hydrogen economy. The UK is doing a masterful job on hydrogen economy, but also on the clean technology. And the lead up to COP26 that's taking place in the UK, aside from G7, the other big event being COP26, I'm just curious how, how the UK is positioning themselves as a global leader in the clean tech space and how we can work collaboratively in that space. 
Perfectly yeah. asked question. <laughs> Have you stolen Mariette's question now? <laughs> it goes around and comes around. Uh, look, COP26, COP you're absolutely right. Um, you, you, you're doing my job better than me at the moment. I should plug the fact that this is a huge priority for the UK. This is, uh, this is five or six years on now from Paris. Um, we're hosting, still hosting that conference. Uh, I think it's the 1st to the 12th of November in Glasgow. Um, that is a huge priority for the British government um, in our global aspirations. In terms of in terms of something concrete on the on the economic side here, we also recently published uh, something called the Das Gupta Review, which looks at the role of how the environment and the economy need to work hand in hand. And I think, you know, I, I can't prejudice quite how influenced that will be, but from where I'm sat right now, it feels like a kind of turning point moment in British policy where there is now a clear framework as a result of a commission report that, that gives us the impetus to really mainstream those environmental thinking within all of our economic decisions. And so clean technology will feature um, throughout that entire industrial supply chain. There are announcements of millions of pounds being thrown at um, industries to try and bring out that cleaner and greener growth. So um, again, this is an area where we have an, we've established a, a fantastic team of climate specialists across uh, the Canada network who would absolutely be happy to talk to provincial governments, uh, provincial economic stakeholders, businesses about how they can get behind the overall objectives of COP26. And also, uh, let's be honest, for the businesses, you know, ride the wave of that commercial opportunity. Thank you. Um, well, if you guys don't have any more questions, we actually saw two hands from the audience. Um, Andy, I don't know if you would be comfortable answering. I think the first person here is Caroline Saunders. <laughs> Caroline, you're unmuted, I think. I didn't have a question for Andy. <laughs> uh, okay, so it was an accident. No, 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 it wasn't an accident. It wasn't an accident. You know me, Sharon, right? I'm the Consul General in Calgary, the British Consul General. I work very closely with Andy, and I just wanted to say hi to everyone okay. online and let you know that I'm here to follow on some of the stuff that Andy's been talking about. And just to reinforce that messaging, um, we will be very much part of the team consulting with you on um, business requirements and, and wishes going forward. And, and I work closely with the Prairie governments and their trade policy teams to have those discussions. So I just wanted to flag that was there. Also really enjoying the discussion on innovation because that is at the heart of the work we do. And just to remind those of you say in Alberta that we do have a UK Alberta memorandum of understanding on technical cooperation that particularly focuses on AI, agri-tech, food tech, healthcare and clean tech. So we're very much in the space with the government looking for uh, opportunities. We do have a current challenge running on agri-tech that's got $7 million uh, worth of funding behind it. That has closed, but there are joint UK, Canada consortia that have benefited from that. And we're looking to do more of those sort of joint collaboration programs. Also that um, there's massive opportunities in, in hydrogen, CCUS, uh, and in the plant protein space that's been mentioned. Uh, so, I mean, I'm very positive as in the same way of Andy is about the opportunities but I just wanted to flag that I'm here as your local point of contact uh, as well as Andy to to sort of follow this up with you and I'm really pleased that uh, Canada West Foundation has you know facilitated this session today so thanks for that. Absolutely and of course I remember you Caroline we love sharing our research work with you all the time so thanks for thanks for speaking up. And I'm very uh, glad that Caroline didn't have a question for me on <laughs> innovation because she knows more than, than almost anyone I know about both of those uh, both those topics. So please do uh, please do talk to Caroline about that as well. All right, um, I think we may we may actually do have some questions. Uh, Claire Cito, um, if you want to ask your question now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Very good. Well, thanks for um, having me. Uh, very interesting. And thank you, uh, Andy, for the uh, the comments. Um, sorry, I joined a couple of minutes late. So some of this may have been captured already, but um, you're not looking for questions, but I actually have three for you. The first one is uh, what time of uh, what timeline does the UK have in mind for the launch of a um, bilateral free trade agreement with um, Canada? There's been uh, various uh, discussions happening, and I wonder if you can uh, provide a bit more specificity on that front. Second question is what kind of gains is the UK looking for in the CPTPP um, that you would not be uh, getting necessarily in a bilateral free trade agreements with uh, Canada? And then the last question is on the Agriculture Commission, which you talked about. Um, is it to also look at how, does it also look at how free trade agreements are implemented um, and how rules are enforced? Or is it solely to provide uh, counsel to the government as it prepares to negotiate free trade agreements? So uh, thanks for those, Claire, and it's great to hear from you as well. Um, I'll try and take those in turn. So the, the first one's a nice, easy one. Um, in terms of the trade continuity agreement between the UK and Canada, it has a binding clause for both countries to get back to the negotiating table within 12 months. Um, so we are looking for those processes to start as soon as possible. Um, of course, the, the trade continuity agreement will be enforced very, very shortly. And I would imagine that very shortly afterwards, we will try and get back to the negotiating table. Um, now, the bit in between when the trade continuity agreement comes into force and when the negotiations begin, I think is the really exciting bit. That's a chance for companies and stakeholders to tell both the British and Canadian government what they want out of the future trade relationship, because CETA uh, the agreement on which the trade continuity agreement was was based. The consultations for that were almost a decade ago now. CETA has been under negotiation and in force for, for almost a decade. And so this really is another opportunity for, for companies to say what they want from, you know, the 2020s and beyond. So, so that's the first. In terms of CPTPP, I, I mentioned briefly some of the advantages um, I'll be honest that if you put each chapter of CPTPP and the trade continuity agreement side by side, there, there are very few areas in which the uh, CPTPP goes further than the bilateral agreement, the bilateral continuity agreement. But that's not to say there aren't advantages. There are standards, for instance, on digital and other areas that go further in the CPTPP. There are also those progressive elements to that, to that uh, trade agreement, which... Uh, go further than some of the clauses within the trade continuity agreement and uh, fundamentally one of the biggest opportunities that I mentioned was around the around the global supply chain so bringing uh, I think 13 percent of world GDP is already a member of that agreement and with the UK that will be 16 percent of global GDP so so real opportunities for supply chains when it comes to the agricultural trade commission um, they have given recommendations across the board so, uh, so 22 recommendations published on Tuesday. And as I say, I, I, I don't want to, uh, off the top of my head, get them wrong, but they are about how we engage with the world across, uh, across all sorts of things. So it's not just, uh, they don't have a mandate just to inform the government what we want out of a free trade agreement. They have a mandate to inform the government's approach to agri-food trade globally. And, and I, uh, also, you, I, I believe you're still based in Ottawa, so we can catch up one day when they open, open the economy back up, we can grab a coffee and talk through this in uh, much more detail. All right, I think we do have very short time for one last question from Stephen Henderson, um, if you would like to ask the question now. Stephen, I think yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've got it un unmuted. So thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Sharon and Andy. Uh, I spent a couple of decades uh, working with community and Aboriginal relations in the resource development field. So it's no surprise I'm interested in uh, your um, government's view of uh, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and what that might mean to uh, further negotiations with uh, Canada and the UK? So it, it's not a topic that has come up within the 
within the confines of the trade continuity agreement. If you could say a little bit more about what you would be seeking in that area, what, what kind of principles and interests you'd be trying to preserve and protect, I'd very happily do my best to answer that. Well, uh, my experience with, with any community and trying to find mutual benefits based on mutual interests is around principles and acting on principles so that in your decision making, it becomes very transparent to those that are interested in how, uh, which way we're going with making uh, uh, progress, uh, how those decisions are rendered based on a set of principles that you uh, espouse and then adhere to. So yeah, I guess um, I'm just offering up my experience. Uh, and um, so maybe that's all I, I need is just to make a statement around uh, how I see success, Andy. No, that, that's really helpful, Stephen. And look, again, I said at the very beginning that you can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or my email address. I'm sure Sharon would be able to share. I'm very happy. I, I'm genuine in, uh, in my desire to hear from as many different people and get as many different ideas and perspectives as possible. Um, and I think that's absolutely a commitment that will be shared by the Canadian government as we go through to consultation. So a lot of this has been focused on uh, trade and business, but of course there's the whole angle of the rest of civil society and stakeholders that absolutely will have uh, have a voice within those consultations. Uh, and when it comes to transparency, uh, the UK government has uh, one of the most transparent uh, parliamentary processes around trade agreements as possible, and so th there will, will be as transparent as possible throughout all of the uh, all of the above all from. Uh, the bilateral free trade agreement that's coming from our accession into the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, I got that right twice in one meeting for the record, uh, and also with our work, like I say, at the World Trade Organization and on the rules-based international system, uh, we, we, we truly are evangelical about the role of free and fair trade in supporting jobs, in supporting growth, and in supporting livelihoods. Thank you so much, Andy, and thanks so much, Stephen, for your question. Now, if our panelists, if you don't have any more questions, I will do the wrap up, but so this is your last chance. No? Okay. I would, ju I would just say, Andy, so you know, glad you hit your KPIs on articulating CPTPP twice in one <laughs> webinar. Yeah. And so happy to hear that you're going to be planning a Western Canadian, you know, roadshow as soon as travel permits. You know, we'd love to have you back out here since your trip last year was such, such a success. And I think we're going to probably have some follow up and maybe some ribbon cutting to do on the uh, funding program that's going to be uh, set up as a result of Sharon and Carlo's position paper on tech collaboration. So looking forward to hosting you uh, as the weather improves and, uh, and hopefully you get inoculated. Thanks, Mustafa. Thank, thank Sounds you. good. Thank you very much. It was terrific. Sounds good. Now, you know, uh, I just want to conclude on, you know, having access to foreign markets is one thing uh, for both UK and for Canada, um, but it doesn't really matter if we cannot move our goods. So that is actually the reason why our, uh, that is exactly what we're focusing on next, next section next next session next week uh, on March 11th is on trade infrastructure with our guest speaker, John Law. Um, if you would like to share um, our recording of this session today, we will have it posted uh, on YouTube as well as on our website, as well as with a link to our new op-ed on Financial Post yesterday on UK uh, joining the CPTPP for Canada. I wanna take my time now to thank both our sponsors and partners, Export Development Canada, Edmonton Global, Calgary Economic Development, World Trade Center Winnipeg, and Step from Saskatchewan, who will be joining us in our next session. Thank you, Andy, so much for speaking with us today. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a good remainder of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And I'll see you out west sometime soon. You Sound bet. good. In a cowboy hat, please. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, everyone.